Hi, my name is James. Welcome to Kinks Fine Woodworking. Today I'm going to show you how to build this kid-sized Adirondack rocking chair. It's the perfect companion to the adult-sized Adirondack rocking chair, or the perfect companion to the kid-sized regular chair. These chairs will fit anyone from 4 to probably about 10 or 11 years old comfortably. And this is my granddaughter Rosa. She is 8 and a half, like and she chair? seems to love the chair. She's not quite old enough to help too much around the shop, but she does come in from time to time to help, and she really wanted to model the chair for the video, so we thought that'd be a great idea. And this is her brother, my grandson, JJ, and he just turned seven, and he also likes the chair. And you can see it's got some kickback protection there at the end, so he can't over-rock it and tumble backwards in the chair. But I think he enjoys it as well. For those who are interested in making money with their woodworking, I'd like to point out a video that we recently had uh, that where we put together a package of plans for sale that we call our Ultimate Adirondack and Outdoor Furniture Package. This package includes all of the top selling projects that there are, and it's the perfect thing to take your sales to the max. With today's project, it now has six plans and four templates, and it also represents the first time we've ever had a sale on any of our furniture plans and we're bringing back the sale here for this video and it's 30% off this package. I'll put a link to the video where I discussed all this in the description below. I'll also put a link to these plans if you should decide to get them. And I'll also put links to each of the individual videos that came out showing in great detail how each and every one of these are built. So there's a lot to look at and that's all in the description down below. One final but very important thing, if at any time in the past you ever bought any one of these plans but you still want the package, it's no problem. You can still get the package if you like and whatever plan or plans you may have bought, I'll substitute one for one for any other plan we have in our library. Um, doesn't matter if you've bought uh, a cheaper plan here but you want a more expensive plan, that's fine. I'll swap any plan out for any one of these that you already have. After you get this package, you just let me know and I'll send the one that you want right away. And now let's jump into today's build video. So I'm going to show you a couple of different things for the build of this chair than what we did in the first three, uh, because there are definitely options out there with how you can put it together. Uh, one of the most popular options is, of course, to get the paper templates. We offer these. Um, they're, they're kind of a, an, in something you would get in addition to the plans. They're not necessary. The plans actually have everything that you need. But if you get these, all the curves that are on the plans are all cut out and in the right shape. You still have to have the plans because they've got 100% of the data, whereas the templates just have part of it. But what I've found is a lot of people out there these days are wanting to cut their pieces out on a CNC machine, or at the very least, cut their own templates. But of course, if you have a CNC, you might as well cut the pieces themselves. So we're just going to show you that briefly, and it works wonderful with a CNC machine. In fact, it's, it's quite a bit faster, so if you are able to sell these and go into any sort of production mode, and there are dozens of fans that I have that follow us around the country that do that, um, they, they, they build anywhere from you know 50 to 150 chairs a year, and they rely on CNC's to get the production gone, going faster. Uh, me and one of my daughters can actually build about four chairs a day with the CNC cutting out all the parts in the background. There are of course still straight parts uh, that have to be cut, and so we're going to cut some of these out while the CNC is running in the background, cutting out the curved parts. Now remember, if you get the paper templates, you do still have to have the plans. Um, and the, pl the paper templates are only good for the curves. You wouldn't find any straight parts on the templates. Uh, because it's quicker just to cut them on your table saw and measure them and chop them to length on the chop saw. Alright, so now we are going to cut out the frontmost seat slat. And these are slanted in a little bit on both sides because the chair tapers toward the back. And we see our CNC is still cutting in the background over there. I think it takes uh, probably an hour and a half maybe to cut out all the curves uh, for a chair on your standard size CNC. We have a two foot by four foot CNC machine. I have a half inch uh, cutting bit in here that I thought I'd test out since we finally got something that would cut that big, but it's, it's no faster than, than a quarter inch bit, which is what all CNC machines take. So I wouldn't advise going that route. The, the, it, just a whole lot more sawdust and there's really no speed gain. So here we're cutting out the front legs for the rocking chair. And they've got different angles on each side. Of course, all the angles are detailed on the plans. And there's a link to the plans in the description down below. 
So like I said, the plans have 100% of all the data. You don't need paper templates and you don't need CNC files. You can just do it with the plans. Having the other things just makes it faster. And we do have uh, CNC files that we sell separately uh, that you can plug into any CNC machine. Doesn't matter what make that it is. Uh, but if you get these, you would not need the paper templates because you could simply cut your own wooden templates uh, with your CNC machine or just skip templates altogether and cut your parts. So once your templates are done in the CNC, I've got little tabs here to kind of keep them together while the cutting process goes. So I separate the tabs and then we will cut out the, uh, cut the little bits of tabs off. Uh, one of my daughters, uh, Covey, is here in the shop helping us. She's moved back to Colorado recently. And her boyfriend, Ryan, that who, that's who's cutting these, he has actually come to the shop to work full time and help us out. So hopefully we'll be able to get uh, more production going and get some more videos out with a little bit more frequency. We've been kind of bogged down with uh, doing production stuff to, to pay the bills with doing custom woodworking projects. But um, I, I enjoy videos a whole lot more. And with his help, I think we'll be able to, to successfully do both. So in this step here, I am putting a little bit of a bevel on the front legs. I'm sorry, this is the back leg, but it's the front part of the back leg of the chair. And it gets the mirror image, the opposite bevel on the other side. And that's because the legs have to taper back at a specific uh, angle. And that's all detailed in the plan. And you can see exac exactly how I did it here. And if you take a look up close, you can see they both have that little uh, six degree angle where they're tapered to the back. And here, this is the, uh, the middle back cradle. And I've set my bandsaw at 30 degrees and I'm just kind of following the corner of it. It was cut out on the CNC, but then I go to the bandsaw and I cut that 30 degree slant off of there. That way it fits with the slope of the, uh, the backs uh, to keep the back sloped backwards. And once I have all the parts done, I'm going to router them. And you can router kind of whatever you want to router. Wherever I have uh, uh, parts that are going to attach together, I don't really uh, apply the router to those. I just uh, route everything else. You know, if I've got two pieces of wood joining, I don't route it. And I don't route the bottom where it goes there. And there's a complete collection of all of the parts to assemble the chair. So here's the rocker. And here's the front leg that attaches to the rocker. Now it's got to attach at a specific point. I've got that point measured out. And you got to make sure you get the right angle there because there's two angles on that. Uh, if you have the paper templates, you can see that it's, uh, it's marked on the paper templates. I basically just cut this out of the template so I could see where that spot was. And I just cut little notches there where that location of the front leg is. And I threw that little piece of paper away so I could see where that goes. Or if you have the plans, of course, you, and you don't get the paper templates, um, it's, it's measured for you. It tells you where to where to make these marks. And this thing is the location of the back leg support. This is like a cross support that goes between the two rockers that will hold the back legs. Because the back legs don't rest on the rockers because they're narrower than the rockers because they tape backwards or taper backwards. And that's exactly where the front leg goes, right between those two lines. And this is the uh, the back leg support, it's going to go like that between the two rockers to carry the back legs. So I'm going to put in a couple of dowels to kind of hold this together. I'm kind of slanting this just a little bit because the angle of the board slanted and, you know, this way the dowels are going to go in a little bit more square. It really doesn't matter. Uh, so this is a doweling jig. There are a lot of uh, different doweling jigs on the market that you can get. This one's really economical and it's and I use it for like everything I need a dowel for. I just pull this out. If you have a domino jig, use that. If you don't, use a dowel jig. Uh, I'll put a link to all the tools I use, specifically things like this dowel jig, in the description below in case there's something that you need to build any of these things with or to build anything else with. You'll see where I got it and what I use. And um, everything that I use here on video is stuff that I've used usually for years and years, and, and I like it a lot. I think it's some of the better stuff out there. So you won't have to go through some trial and error because there's a dozen different uh, Chinese-branded doweling jigs on the market, a lot of which are not really any good. Uh, but this one's really quite good. So I've marked uh, uh, the locations on both the leg and the rocker. I drilled holes on both the leg and the rocker. And now I'm going to go ahead and apply glue so that I can uh, put this leg together. So I like to get some glue in the holes and, of course, glue where the leg is going to bond. 
and we'll fit the dowel in there and we can tap it down a little bit it's got a bottom out about halfway because I set the depth on the drill bit to be just a little over uh, the halfway length of that dowel so it can't push too far into one side that one on the right there did bottom out all the way and we'll get a good coat of glue here where that leg is going to sit down. It is uh, end grain on the leg, but yeah, a little, every little bit of glue helps. And the dowels keep it positioned and the dowels add some support. And of course we'll glue the leg as well. And then we'll put this together. In truth, this is probably plenty of support, but we're gonna, we'll do one more thing to make it even a little bit stronger than that. And that is I'm going to take these uh, GRK uh, number 10 by 4 inch screws. It's a little bit thicker than a regular screw. And it's just a nice long screw. I'm going to sink it into about that point. And that's what this drills for to give me kind of some space for the head of the screw. I'm going to sink it into about this point to kind of hold that piece down. And this is called an aircraft uh, drill bit that I just showed you, the long one. Uh, I think in the airline industry, aircraft uh, uh, repair industry, they use these long drill bits a lot. And uh, you can get them on Amazon. I'll put a link to those. And that's when I want to drill something really deep because typically smaller drill bits like 1 8 or whatever, they don't come very long. So I've got the, the hole pre-bored a little bit. And then I'll just sink it the rest of the way here with this drill bit. And that'll kind of give me a, a path for that screw to follow. And then the screw won't be going in so tight it, it, you know, that it threatens to split the wood or anything. And that screw will really hold this down securely while that glue dries and, of course, being a metal high strength screw, it'll give considerably more support to this joint. Although this joint is not a highly loaded joint because they're stacked one on top of the other. So it's going to be pretty strong uh, any way you look at it. And we'll do the, the same on the opposite side. So that we have two uh, mated pairs. And then I kind of like to hold off on routing the leg and the rocker uh, to a point where I can do them together. Um, just because I think it looks a little bit better. It looks like a more continuous routing when that's all done. If you enjoy our videos, I hope you will consider subscribing and giving us a thumbs up at the end of this video. New subscribers are the single most important way to help this channel grow. And if you'd consider that, we'd really appreciate it. Rather than wait till the end to sand everything, I kind of just sand as I go. And being that it's outdoor furniture, I typically stop sanding this anywhere between 120 and 150 and I don't bother going any further because it's going to get an oil finish. So now it's time to start our assembly. Uh, let's take a look at these two legs, the back legs, and let's make sure that they're in this orientation before we start, where they're both pointing in each other, because that's going to cause them to taper inward. And we'll make sure that the front cross piece is also set at that same angle. That way it keeps the legs pointing inward at the back because this whole seat gets narrower as you progress towards the back of the chair. Um, this is much easier done with two people if you have one to help hold it in place and Ryan is helping me hold that. If you don't have two people you may have to clamp it or you may have to do a little uh, finish nail to hold it in place first and then follow up with some screws but there are definitely some options there that you can uh, exercise. Uh, but if you do have two people it does make it handy and I, and I realize not everybody has that in their shop. So I just uh, pre-drill both sides with a countersink. Uh, this particular type of countersink is set so that I could uh, plug the hole if I wanted to. I am not going to plug the hole. I typically don't for outdoor furniture that I keep myself, but you can do that and that certainly does dress up the furniture. And I'm using three, three inch deck screws here. These are Deckmate deck screws. There's a link to those in the description below. And this is where the um, the back leg support goes and what I've done is since it's drawn on the inside I put three holes in it from the inside pilot holes kind of going all the way out so I know where I'm going to put my screws in that way I don't have to guess or measure um, I'll have it held on one side Ryan's helping me hold it he's holding it exactly in the spot where it goes and then I'm on the other side and I'll put a couple of tacks in with some finish nails get some galvanized finish nails or something so they don't uh, rust out on you of course, I do usually finish fill those with putty, but now I've got the holes here and I'm going to go ahead and expand the outer two holes with my countersink bit because I'm just going to put regular screws in there to kind of help hold it together. Again, these are three inch deck screws that I'm putting in and I put a three inch deck screw everywhere where it fits. If I'm uh, doing two pieces of this wood together side by side, only a two and a half inch will fit before it pokes through. So you choose whether you use a three or a two and a half and the very center hole 
I'm drilling a hole here to expand it a little bit because I'm going to be putting in, uh, and this is my, my pilot drill here, I'm going to be putting in a much bigger screw here. Probably not terribly necessary for a kid's chair um, because there's not a lot of forces applied to this like there were to the adult chairs. So I'm just going to put a single one of these screws in. And once I have that to depth, I've got that going in the whole depth of the screw. This is a 5 16th inch uh, by 4 inch long GRK screw. That's uh, it's an engineered screw. Uh, I think these screws are rated like at seven or 800 pounds, a lot of weight. So collectively, collectively one on each side will hold about 1,500 pounds, which is far more than is what's necessary. But it's going to definitely hold this chair together forever. And this is the front leg bracket that we just put together so far. And you'll notice that this is kind of a straight corner here. Either you drew it and cut it or you cut it on the CNC. And this thing goes kind of goes all the way back against that. If you sand that off, you'll have to measure that and get back to that point. But if you try to keep your corners square, you'll see it. So I'm just going to hold that in place and put some countersink holes in and then screw this together. Here again, I can fit a 3-inch screw. So that's exactly what I'm going to put in on each side. If all you wanted to buy is a pack of 2 and a halfs, that's fine for a kid's chair. Uh, for an adult's chair and you see we have some flexibility in the system i don't expect it to align perfectly because these boards naturally have a little bit of warp coming from the big box store but like i was saying on the uh, the adult chairs uh, you want to use three inch wherever you can kids chair just not as much force not as much loading so you could you could really build the whole thing with two and a halfs and there's that that's the seat and uh, front legs so it slides in right here rests on that back leg support and we raise it up to the right elevation and it fits there so we'll take a couple measurements to make sure it's going to go into the right spot before i do that i'm going to kind of clamp it loosely in place then i can tap it around to take my measurements and get it exactly where i want and i want to make sure that both of those are resting flat on the back and they look good if they're warped and one's not, you can kind of squeeze it or force it. And from the ground, I've got a certain distance that I'm measuring up. That altitude's critical. We will have that marked on the plan. And uh, you can also measure from the inside of the rocker in alignment with the, uh, with the front part of that front leg. And that's also a certain distance up there. So either one of those two measurements will work. Mostly we're making sure they're the same. That's what's most important. And oh, one final thing is that is it is inset just a little bit behind the front curve of that front two by four. It's not up flush with it since that already has a radius round over from the store. Um, it's going to inset just a little behind it. I'm just going to put a single screw in here because this front cross piece doesn't really have a lot of loading. It's not really carrying the leg assembly, although it could once again, because this is just a kid's chair. But uh, this is just more for giving us a little bit of extra stability and holding the, the thing together a little bit stronger. And I'll use the three inch deck screws here too. I get a ceramic coated deck screw. That's what the deck mates are. Uh, they'll never rust or rot or corrode or anything. And I can take that off now and we can continue fastening this together. And I'll check to make sure both of those touch at the back. If they don't, you may have to sand one down a little bit. One of those bumps down on the back of the uh, rocker if they're not meeting evenly, just, just for looks purposes. Maybe your boards were a little warped. Then I'll go ahead and secure both of those in, the bottom part of that back leg. They're not going any anywhere anyway, but that'll hold them and prevent them from sliding backwards as someone plops down in that chair. Then I'm going to put this front arm on. I've got distances that I have to measure off of the front and off of the side. And it doesn't have to be super critical. And being that the arm is pretty short, it's fairly easy to hold it in place while I measure it and drill it. I'm only going to put the frontmost screw in. Obviously, I can fit two screws there, you know, one towards the front and one towards the back. But I don't want to do that yet because I want to have the ability to have, have some flexibility. I'm going to check it here and make sure that's right. If it's not, I'd probably have to redo it and set one at the back. But I need this to be able to move back and forth for setting the back up. And you'll see that in just a moment. And we'll do the same thing with the other front arm. 
So they're just kind of suspended in space here, you know, with one little screw, and they can wiggle back and forth as needed. So obviously you don't rest on them or put a lot of weight on them or anything like that at that point. They're still a little delicate. And you see why those have to flex, and that's so I can fit this middle back cradle in just right. And we're going to use a clamp to kind of hold that in place once we have it lined up the way we want it. Maybe keep the clamps off to one side. I've got them clamped loosely so I can tap them together and get them just right. You'll probably have to get one of these Thor's hammer woodworking mallets that we make in order to tap this just right. And then I'll go ahead and squeeze that clamp down nice and snug uh, once we have it exactly where we want it. And then I want to check and make sure that that whole arm assembly is equidistant from the rocker. So luckily it all will still move because we only have a single screw up front and the clamps aren't all that tight. So I'm dropping kind of a plumb bob here and I'm going to measure this over. Your measurements may be different than mine. I think I came in at about uh, three and a half or three and five eighths or something like that. I can't recall. It looks like it's three and a quarter there, but I think it was actually about three and five eighths. But if yours are a little different, that doesn't make any difference at all. Just make sure they're the same. That's what matters. And I would expect them to be a little different. You may, you, all of your cuts could be just a teeny bit smaller or a teeny bit bigger. And, you know, these, these may not be exact. But as long as they're the same, then you know your arms and the back of your chair is dead centered on the whole chair assembly. And that's what the most important thing is. So now we have it assembled. Or, 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 or even, I guess I should say. Now I'm going to put a 3 8 inch hole in. I'll actually put a couple, so I'm going to kind of drill this off to one side. The exact hole location doesn't matter. Um, just get it in there and get it off to one side so I have room to get another one on the other side. That's a 3 8 inch carriage bolt. Uh, you can use stainless steel or galvanized. If you use zinc, it'll last for a while, but, you know, in you know, a decade it's probably start to rust. And then I want to sink that uh, in tight enough to where I see the, the washer sucking into the wood and the top really pulling down in nice and tight. Get all that dust out of my way. And we'll do the same thing on the other side. I'm kind of supporting the the arm with uh, by holding the clamp so I don't push down too hard on the arm because remember it only has a single screw up front. And then we're going to go ahead and put an extra bolt in the back back here. This is kind of a critical joint. That's why I want these two bolts here as opposed to a couple of screws. Here again, I think you could probably get away with screws, but you know it's just a few cents for the bolt. You really should go for that, and then you've got something that's going to last a lifetime. And you can watch and see what happens here as I uh, apply the torque. It's going to pull that bolt head down tight. Actually, that's my wife Rupa. She's doing this for me. And that pulled the other one down tight too. So just do that until they become nice and snug. And there, that's there's that assembly. So that's looking pretty good. All right, now we're going to put a bolt in the leg. Now this bolt goes anywhere really in this leg um, from the front leg to the back leg, kind of ignoring the front cross piece. And that's what's going to carry the load of the seat. So even a great big heavy adult could get in here or an adult could stand on it and use it as a step stool if they wanted. It's not going to break because that carriage bolt is going to carry a thousand pounds of, uh, of weight. You know, no problem. And do the same thing here. Screw it down nice and tight so where the washer kind of sinks into the wood just a little bit. And so far, so good. Now I'm going to start putting the back slats in, and I want them to be even across the top, which means they need to be even across the bottom. So I'm going to temporarily hold this little piece of wood underneath here for these to rest on while I'm doing the install. And I'll just clamp that piece of wood down there for now. You could, you could screw it in or, or whatever you like, but I'll clamp it down there, do the install of all the back slats, and then I'll unclamp that and let that go. But at least for right now, It'll carry the weight of those back slats and, and keep them all lined up nice and even. And now that we know we're done with the arm assembly and it doesn't need to wiggle left or right, it probably can't anyway, I'm going to go ahead and put the second screw uh, in on both sides of that. And that'll firm that up a little bit more because we're going to be putting a little bit of torque on the back of it put the slats in. And one thing I'll do is I just want to measure and kind of get the midpoint of where the middle back slat's going to go. There are nine back slats for this chair, so that's an odd number, so there will be a very middle one. So I'll put one on each side first. This is the left side. I'm just going to tack it in with a finish nail, high and low. I am going to come back and putty those little nail holes there. 
I use a nail set if need be and drive those in a sixteenth of an inch and then just put a dab of putty so they'll really disappear before I get the oil on it. And here's the middle back slat. The middle back slat I'm going to put in too. I'm just going to put that in the middle though. I'm not going to fasten it to the top just yet. I want it to be able to move back and forth. And so there's only six left. So that means I'll just set three on the left side and three on the right side. And that's how those will fill out. We know we have roughly the same space at the bottom on the left and on the right. And I'm just going to manually separate them by hand by eye. I'm just going to look at it and get a little bit of a gap between each one, make it look about even, and that's all that's needed. If you want to get super specific, you probably could measure the gap, get it identical, but everybody's uh, boards are going to be fractionally thinner or fractionally thicker, and it's just not a big deal. Just get them evenly spaced, and you'll never be able to tell that they're not perfect. And once we get them evenly spaced, then I'll do the same thing. I'll come through and I will just tack these in on the top. Just with a single tack. And then we can come in and put some screws. I'm going to use the upper back cradle as kind of like an arc to measure. I'm measuring a straight line directly over the middle back cradle. This will keep my screws in a neat line so that it looks a little bit neater instead of those going up and down. I think the first chair I did, I didn't do that, and I was really in a, in a, not really a hurry, I suppose, but I had so much going on I was trying to convey, I skipped that, and so the screws kind of went up and down a little bit, and um, several viewers were very mad. They said, your chair's so pretty, but the, you don't have a straight line there, and you've just ruined it. So um, I made sure to, to do that here. And we'll countersink the bottom after we've done the top. And do the same thing there and sink all these screws in. And you can see I've just, you know, roughly uh, positioned them all equidistant apart. And that ends up looking pretty good. So we get them all countersink and we'll put these screws in. These got to be two and a half because towards the middle of this lower back cradle on the back side, it's not too thick. And uh, if I was to use a three inch deck screw, this is what I was talking about, it might poke through right there. And I'm done with that temporary support. So I've unclamped it and taken it out. And that's the back. So what we need to do is secure it at the top now. This kind of holds it together because if we don't, over time, these boards will warp. So I've clamped the middle, and I'm kind of spacing these also individually by eye, getting them all about the same distance apart and putting in a pilot screw, a pilot hole, I mean. And, uh, and then we'll go back in and fill those up with screws. Obviously, I can't put a, a hole and a screw in the one that's being clamped, but I'll do that one very last. There we go, that wraps that up, and then those are all done. So I've made that upper back cradle a little bit short from going all the way to the edge. That way it doesn't show through in the front. I think that looks a little better. And there, you can see the back slats are even across the top there. All right, so this is the rearmost seat slat. We'll put that in first. It's got an arc in it that kind of fits the contour of that, and it's straight in the front. It just gets a single screw. That one, of course, is measured, so we know the distance left to right on that, whereas the remainder of the seat slats, the middle ones, we don't know their length. But we'll uh, counter put in some countersink holes and then put in a screw on either side, and then we'll go ahead and set these in. Now, all of these, I'm just cutting them, you know, about an inch longer than they need to be or whatever. And we're going to trace them from underneath and cut them to fit. Here's the frontmost seat slat. Uh, that one is, of course, measured, and so it just kind of fits right in. I have some 1 8 inch shims that I've cut, and we'll just kind of fit these in to get my, our spacings, and then we'll come underneath here and trace these. That way when I cut them, they'll be the exact fit, exact length. And it's best to do it this way if you're building them, because if you tried to cut all these to exact length and you just made, you know, like your front cross piece a eighth of an inch longer on accident, um, then all these would be short. Um, your chair would still be functional, but you might as well just wait till the end and trace these and cut these. And we just take these over to the chop saw. I'll set my chop saw at six degrees. That's the taper from the front to the back. And I'll just cut right along that line on both sides. And then we know uh, that they're all, all going to be correct with the given spacers. And what I'm going to do is I need to line them all up on one side so that I can router that end because I would like for these things to be routed all the way around. And of course, you know, the front and back have already been routed when I was routering everything. Um, but I didn't router the ends because I knew I had to chop those off. So we'll just kind of squeeze them together, hold them, get a little palm router, 
I'm using a quarter inch, oh, I'm sorry, I'm using actually a um, 3 8 inch radius round over bit here. And we'll do the same on the other end as well. Then we'll put them back in place. Make sure we get our spacers back in. And I think I'll probably leave the spacers to the side like this. They're just a little bit easier to pull out. We'll get them lined up flush with the edge of the chair, which they fit now nicely because we traced it. And just a single screw on each side will lock these all down nicely. If you have one gap that's a little big or a little small, no big deal. It never really will be noticed. Uh, if your spacer is too big or too small, if your spacer is too, uh, too big, you can just leave the spacer out and just kind of eyeball the gap, and it'll look just, just as good. All right, so the last piece I think that we're going to assemble is this bracket. Now, this bracket is a little bit structural on the adult chairs because the adult arms are quite a bit wider, um, but it's not really here. It's more decorative. So I'm just going to glue it in. It's pretty thin. It's not really, doesn't have a whole lot of structure to it to screw. It would probably split. So I just put some bunch of CA glue and then I finished it. Uh, uh, I cured it instantly with some of the instant set stuff. And that's it. That's the build of the chair. It's all done there. So I'm going to take a few minutes and I'm going to sand off the pencil marks, sand over any rough spots, and I am going to putty the nail holes so that all we have are screw holes. And that completes the chair. And the next step and final step, of course, is to put the finish. Now you could put the finish at the beginning, uh, like once your pieces are all made, if you like, there's no problem with that. Just know that you can't glue the chair together. And I didn't glue this chair together because I am actually shipping this particular chair away and I, I'm gonna have to disassemble it to ship it. Um, so I didn't bother gluing it, but if you did glue it, you would have to put the stain after, the oil finish after, and that's what I'm doing here to show you that it can certainly be done after the chair is already assembled. So I do recommend gluing it. I guess that's what I'm getting at. Even though I didn't, I do recommend that you glue the chair together. If you don't have to disassemble it later, it makes the chair a whole lot stronger. Um, just make sure you use something good like Tight Bond 3, which is uh, very water resistant, nearly waterproof, and it will last outdoors forever. That's the best thing to do. And I hope you guys enjoyed watching this video. Uh, please take the time to subscribe to the channel. It really helps us grow, and we very much appreciate it. And to all of the members of our community group on Facebook, thank you very much for watching us and supporting us and staying with us. And uh, it was you guys that really wanted to see the child's rocking chair done, so we built this for you guys. If anyone else out there wants to see this uh, this chair built, and there's 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 the piece in the in the collection of our outdoor stuff, and uh, now it's part of the the, the sale. Um, the, it's called the Ultimate um, Adirondack and Outdoor Furniture Package. I'll have a link to it down below. It's 30% off if you buy the package. And like I said earlier in the video, that if you already own one of the pieces, uh, we'll substitute any other piece we have in exchange for that. But thanks to everybody who watches and thanks to everybody who supported us. And if you like are interested in joining our Facebook group, uh, it's for woodworkers only. And uh, it's a great place to share your work and get help. And I'll leave a link to that also in the description down below and JJ and Rosa had a great time getting to sit in this and model for the video so I hope you guys enjoyed watching it thanks again for watching it until next time take care so what do you think you like that chair <laughs>